Hi, Pete Calandra here, and this video is part of a lesson for a film scoring class I teach at the Copeland School of Music. Today, I'd like to talk about film scoring using the Norman Lear biopic from the 2017 Kennedy Center Honors to help demonstrate some ideas and techniques. The first step is to get the film and watch it. Get familiar with the film and your idea of what story the filmmaker wants to tell. Talk with the filmmaker and work together to create a set of spotting notes, which will be your roadmap for scoring the film. Also, discuss the overall tone of the film and any broad stylistic ideas they may have. In other words, is the film best served by orchestral music or music that is more electronic in nature? Things of this sort. Once you come up with a broad instrument palette, discuss the musical language. It might help if they have some music they like to give you a reference. Then discuss things like, how does the score start? What is the overall pacing of the film as it unfolds? Where do they want the high points and low points? And how do they want the score to end? Do they want it to end on an upbeat note, sad or reflective note, or anything else? The goal here is to not micromanage your creativity, but to help you conceptualize the overall background structure that you will be composing to. The second step would be to get a quick time version of the film that's compatible with both your system and your DAW. A DAW is a digital audio workstation. That would be software like Logic, Cubase, Performer, Pro Tools, whatever you use to compose with. Make sure that you have both a clean dialogue track and a clean music track if they have any placeholder or temp music for you. The way I do that is to have them pan the dialogue all the way to the left and the music all the way to the right. In your DAW, you can split this stereo track into two mono tracks, one with separate music and one with separated dialogue. Next, you need to get the frame rate for the film. The way I do this would be to open the film in QuickTime. Okay, we've got our film here in QuickTime. And use the key command, Command-I. And that brings up this little window here called the Inspector. Here we can see all sorts of info, but the most important to us right now is that the FPS, or frames per second, is at 29.97. Once you have this info, Make sure that you set up your DAW so that its SMPTE readout matches the film's frames per second rate. And also make sure that your session SMPTE start time matches the start time on the film. So what do I mean by that? Let's go back to our film here. And right at the beginning here, we are at no hours, 59 minutes, 59 seconds, and zero frames. That's the first frame of this film and we're at 29.97. So in Pro Tools, what I would do would be to go to Setup Menu and Session Setup. That is also Command 2 using the numeric keypad on your Apple keyboard. Notice we have our time code rate here with all these different options and we set it up to 29.97 FPS and our session start is already set up correctly, but I would just type in Right, 59, 59, enter. On a side note, please make sure that you have all your content in one master folder so that it is organized and not all spread out and difficult to manage. Here is the session that I'm using for this demonstration. And notice it has a video files folder. So I'm just gonna drag this video into this folder and now all the information Pro Tools needs to run this session is contained inside this master session folder. Once that's done, import the film and audio from the film into your DAW. File, import, video. And then I would just navigate, open, and there'll be another dialog that I get. I'm going to import the video to a new video track at the beginning of the session, and I'm going to import the audio from the file. Click OK. It'll ask me where I'd like to send the audio. Choose Destination Folder, 
open. Now it'll import the audio. And here we have our film. And here we have our stereo audio track. You can see that the left track has one waveform shape and the right track has another waveform shape. So I would right click here and split into mono. I no longer need to see this, so I can hide this and make it inactive and then pan both of these tracks to the center. And if I solo this, the Mr. Punker. No, let me tell you something, Mr. Right? I don't need to hear that click track either. That's the dialogue. And here's the temporary music. Now, obviously, it's in stereo, the final mixed music. For my purposes here, I only need to hear it in mono. At this point, I want to make it very clear that I'm a big proponent of organization and preparation. Cluttered space equals cluttered mind, and failing to prepare is preparing to fail. I try to keep these two important adages in my mind when working. It's also important to separate out different tasks like keeping purely technical acts away from creative actions. The part of my brain that's used to organize and set up a session is different from the part that I compose and create with. That being said, they're both complementary and a good balance between the two is essential for being creative. Composing also requires a certain flow, much like improvising a jazz solo, and to be in the moment with no disruptions and distractions also helps with being creative. With this in mind, I like to organize my sessions right from the beginning. I've color-coded the film and both of the audio tracks I imported from that film. I'll keep them at the bottom of my arrange or edit page. Also, you would be well served to have a consistent naming system for all your content. Again, I'm being a big stickler for organization. It saves you time over the long haul. The way I name my sessions is, as you can see right here, the name of the project, the version, and a date, and followed by my initials. Always important to have your initials on your work. Once you've done this, you can move on to the next step. Setting up your counter so you can see bars and beats and Simpty at the same time. The way I do that in Pro Tools is I make sure that I'm on bars and beats with my main counter, and then I show the sub counter and make sure that that is set up for time code. In this example, we'll be examining a film that's only a little bit over three minutes long, so there'll only be one session for this entire film. If you were scoring a longer film, these steps would apply for every cue that makes up the score. Before I do anything else, I mark up the timeline with info from the spotting sessions. I make sure that all the time properties for all of the markers are based on absolute time and not bars and beats. Right here, time properties, absolute, not bars and beats. This is because if they were based on bars and beats, their position on the timeline would change depending upon the tempo. It takes less time at 200 beats a minute to go six measures than it does at 60 beats per minute. So if you have something set to bar six and you change the tempo, that marker will move if it's based on bars and beats. If it's based on absolute time, it stays steady irrespective of the tempo. Okay, let's take a look at some of these markers. So I've got the open, I've got when tempo starts, stop music because there's an all in the family bit. This is where the music is supposed to come back in. We're going to stop again because there's another bit from all in the family. Back to tempo. Right here is where I'm gonna start the transition to get into Pearl Harbor. Right, so you can see that these markers they just give me some broad strokes. I have my spotting notes also. It just gives me the background structure that I'm going to be composing to. And I also make sure that my markers are colored. This way they're easy to see. At this point, there are a few ways you can go. One way is to set up very broad strokes in your sequencer so that you only have a few tracks to work from and then detail that out later. Another way is to simply compose with only a piano track and orchestrate from that. 
The way I chose to do this score is to load in all the instruments and additional tracks I'll be using to compose. As this is an orchestral score, I'm setting up my instruments as I would on score paper. There are, from top to bottom, high winds, low winds, high brass, low brass, percussion, piano harp, and then strings. Also note, and we'll go over this in more detail in a minute, that there are both ensemble patches and soloists in the brass and winds, and that I have different size horn sections from a soloist to two players to 12 players in unison. The top section of the strings contains a mix of ensemble and sectional sounds and also different section sizes from full orchestral strings to chamber strings with only a few players per section. The reason I have ensemble sounds in the winds, brass, and strings is twofold. Ease of writing and the sound. With deadlines, playing parts in with two hands saves some time, which helps. Also, as this track is going to be completely realized in MIDI with no live players, having an ensemble play notes in unison or orchestrated all in a room together gives you a sound that can't really be achieved by playing each line in with separate instruments. There's something to the way that the players blend and the overtones produced and captured in the room that is unique. As long as you have soloists to contrast here, this is a great way to work in MIDI. Now, before we start going through these tracks in detail, I want to say that my goal here is not to sound just like an orchestra, but to make the sounds that I'm using work well in context. I want to produce a compelling and dynamic track that helps the narrative unfold. That being said, I do pay attention to all the normal techniques used in a traditional score. Several examples of this would be things like making sure lines for winds and brass don't go on for longer than someone can actually play them. Making sure I only use the extremes of an instrument's register for special effects. Using dynamics, changing textures, and all the techniques that a great orchestrator would use in a score. So let's go through some of these tracks. I'm going to make everything bigger here so it's easier for us to see. So here are my high winds, and this is an ensemble track. You can hear clarinet, oboe, and flute. Then I've got a solo piccolo. Solo flute. Oboe. English horn. clarinet, and here are my low-end tracks that are all ensembles, and this is just a different, right, this one has an octave lower added to it, and in my brass, this is a midsection brass ensemble which is French horns and trombones, I believe. Then I've got my solo trumpet. Solo horn. Let me make that a little louder for you. Solo horn tenuto. Two horns, this will be a staccato patch. Right? Two horns playing in unison. So if I play dyads, it will sound like four horns. If I play triads, it will sound like six horns. For the end here, I've got 12 horns in unison. Very powerful. Then in my low brass, two trombones in unison. And then I believe there are two low brass ensemble patches. And then this one here. Then my percussion, my cymbals, timpani, snare, different sounds, tubular bells, 
orchestra bells, my piano track, and my harp. Then we're right into our strings here. So this is an audio track. Let me solo this out. This is string runs. So this is a string section actually playing that run instead of me playing each note individually. I like to sprinkle those in for added realism. If I played them in note for note, it would sound programmed. And we have our spiccato violins, second violins. These are large sections, violas, celli, and short bass. Now this is an ensemble. Right, an entire string ensemble. And that is not a chamber group, that is a large string section because I contrast that with chamber violin one, which is probably somewhere between four and six players. You can hear that that's a different sound than, right? Even though the articulation is different, you can hear the timbre is much different. Chamber violin two, cello, oh no, this is violin two, here it is. This is viola. Now, it doesn't look like I've actually used those, some of those tracks, but I have them in there. This is cellos. Chamber cello staccato. It says pizzicato, but that's actually staccato. And our chamber basses. And here we have a chamber ensemble. Make that a little louder. This is ensemble spiccato. This is Albion one strings. It's a very large section. Next we have our flautando strings. This is a playing technique where the player bows close to or over the fingerboard, and this creates almost a flute-like sound. This is an interesting playing technique called air and ice. Right, you can hear it's very thin, very little vibrato. And this is pulsing consordinos. Right, you can hear there's something going on there. So these are my unusual textures that you can't really program. This is a swarm. Swarm winds. And then we've got a couple of Evo patches. Right, where the sound evolves over time. And these are, again, things that you can't really program in. Continuing on with the next step, more organization. In this score, all the tracks are color-coded. Winds in purple, brass in pink, the percussion in blue, right? Piano and harp is in red, and the strings are in green. Below all the instrument tracks are the audio outputs for each group. And these are also color-coded and put in the same order as the instrument groups above. These AUGS tracks, or subgroups as they are called, create a virtual submixer. This type of routing makes it easier to control the tone shaping with EQ and compression for each section of instruments, as you can affect the entire group through one output instead of having to deal with them individually. This helps to create a more cohesive, tighter, and blended sound when mixing your track. Part of composing is to also mix as you create. Not a final mix, but getting things to sound balanced with the right kinds of time-based effects like reverb and delays, and these things can also really help you with the composing process. Assume that your clients cannot imagine what a score will sound like when it's mixed. It'll help you to sell your cue if it sounds great.
Below, all these audio outputs are my time-based effects. In this track, I'm just using a hall reverb and a special modulated reverb based on some of the work that Brian Eno did with Harold Budd that I like to use on ambient piano tracks. The red track has all the music and effects routed through it, so I have one master volume for the music. This makes it easy to bring the volume of the music down so you can hear the narrative. Just one fader for the entire volume of the music. There is one last set of tracks. These are the VCA master tracks. That would be this one, all these tracks that are black in color. These serve three functions. First, they help to separate out each group of instruments, much as you would find on a score paper. Secondly, they give me a very quick way to solo each section to listen. And lastly, they are an additional volume control for each instrument group. The track order of this session is set up as a combination of orchestral score paper and a proper studio mixing desk. I do some version of this consistently for every piece of music I write and before I add a single note to any score. It helps my creative flow to separate out the purely technical and the creative tasks. It's not efficient to keep shifting your mind back and forth between creating and being a technician. Every switch you make interrupts the flow of music, and for me, it's not a switch that I can turn on or off very easily. It's like surfing a wave. You miss one, and then you have to wait a while for the next good wave to come in. You're doing technical work, and then you want to create, well, I have to wait until the flow starts happening again. And when you're on a deadline, time is money, and time is pressure, and you want to relieve the pressure. You want to just be able to create. This is the main reason why I find it useful to thoroughly prepare before you start working. As I said earlier, failing to prepare is preparing to fail. And that is an adage I keep in mind all the time. In this film, bar one of the music is at Simpty, one hour, no minutes, eight seconds, and 29 frames. This is pretty easy to set up in Pro Tools using the Time Operations window Move Song Start function. The key command for this is Option 1, with 1 being the numeral on the numeric keypad to the right of the QWERTY keyboard. Simply type in the SMPTE number for the first beat of the bar, which is already done here, and then you would renumber the song start to bar 1, and then you would hit Apply. Very often, you will be asked to make revisions to the score, so knowing how to operate your DAW is essential, because there will be times that some gymnastics with tempo and meter have to be done during revisions, and new music made to fit in between sections that will be left untouched. After I finished scoring this film, it was decided to add some atmospheric music that led into the opening during the first eight seconds. Rather than reconstruct my entire tempo map, I just played a series of piano chords, one at a time, taken from a pre-existing section of the film, and timed them to the picture change. To add to the atmospheric quality, I automated the level of the Eno reverb so that it was only in the spots where the piano needed it for the atmospheric effect. You can see that right here in the automation lane. So let me solo the piano and play it with no reverb. And now with the hall reverb. Better. And now with the Eno hall. It almost adds additional harmonics to the sound. Well, not almost. It does add additional harmonics to the sound and makes the chords sound much more complicated than they are. 
Also, to add to the mood of this new opening, I made use of some of the special string effects. The ones I chose would be the flautandos and the air and ice sustained high strings. That would be these two tracks here. Let's listen to those together. You notice that when we get into this area here, that the air and ice strings start to add a very subtle pulse to the music. It's very subtle, but you can hear it. And then with the flautandos. Right, you can hear they're the higher octave there. Added to that are some low string swarms, which are randomly played staccato notes that give motion to the section without having a defined rhythm. Right. Now, one thing that I do is I do a lot of automation. And if I go to my controllers here and we look at the mod wheel and we look at expression, you can see that I've drawn both of those in. And the mod wheel and expression control different aspects of the dynamics of the sound. Right, and you can see that all of those hits are perfectly timed to every picture change. The way I did that was very simple. I found the spot where each one of those pictures started and I used wait for note recording and then I just simply hit record and played the chord and then I would go to the next chord and do the same thing. So I did that four times. At bar one, the story starts and this is exposition where the narrator starts to give some background on Norman's childhood and how it showed up in his later work. The function of the music here was basically to give some motion and be upbeat, positive, and in proportion to where we are in the film. Proportion is a big part of telling a story in music. Knowing the right amount of a style to add relative to the action on the screen, the narrative, or where in the timeline you are in the story is an immensely important skill to develop. Okay, you can see here that that's a very simple opening, but it gives me material that I will be able to develop later on in the film. Let's listen to that with the voiceover. Norman Milton Lear grew up in New Haven, Connecticut. His father, Herman, gave him the nickname Meathead. Let me tell you something, Mr. Punker. The first timing trick here is to find a tempo that works so that I can stop the music when the All in the Family clip comes in. At 116 beats per minute, I found that I could compose four full measures of music and have a stop on bar five, beat two, that will dovetail into the scene. The stop also has to almost be a commentary on what will happen in the TV show. I chose a stop note on the French horn as a transition. It's kind of a sarcastic sound in sync with the tenor of the dialogue. Let's watch one more time and listen. Norman Milton Lear grew up in New Haven, Connecticut. His father, Herman, gave him the nickname Meathead. Let me tell you something, Mr. Bunker. No, let me tell you something, Mr. Stivic. You are a meathead. <laughs> what did you call me? A meathead, dead from the neck up. Meathead. <laughs> Keeping the same tempo, I needed a bar of 3-4 at measure 11 to start the music again on a downbeat at measure 12. Once the music comes back in, there's another four-bar phrase that is a continuation of the previous music with another stop on beat 2, this time with a piano added to the sustained horn. Also to note that this music moves the narrative with a very sparse melodic content. I just have those notes in the piano. Listen. Norman Milton Lear grew up in New Haven, Connecticut. His father, Herman, gave him the nickname Meathead. 
Let me tell you something, Mr. Bunker. No, let me tell you something, Mr. Stivic. You are a meathead. <laughs> what did you call me? A meathead. Dead from the neck up. Meathead. <laughs> Herman favored colorful expressions, often encouraging Norman's mother, Jeanette, a.k.a. ding Dong, to stifle. Will you stifle? <laughs> In the beginning of the piece, what's keeping the rhythm is just the harp and the chamber strings. The second time through, I add a line in the cello, and there's low winds... Right? And again, the way that I've timed out these descending lines here is that they're a little humorous. Just a little humorous. I don't want to go over the top. And even though there is a piano on the French horn right here, this piano is hit harder and it's more in the forefront. Right, so this time through, I've got the piano doubled with the bells. Right, it's a nice subtle touch. So I'm just adding every time through a little variation. It's not exact repetition. I want this story to keep developing. So if you keep changing the orchestration a little bit, changing the music a little bit, you get this circular feeling of the music constantly changing and evolving to go along, and that helps to move the narrative along. So let's now go back to the beginning and listen to all this from the open with the dialogue. Well, I have never been in a situation in my life, however tragic, where I didn't see some comedy. Just growing up the way I grew up. Norman Milton Lear grew up in New Haven, Connecticut. His father, Herman, gave him the nickname Meathead. Let me tell you something, Mr. Bunker. No, let me tell you something, Mr. Stivic. You are a meathead. <laughs> what did you call me? A meathead. Dead from the neck up. Meathead. Herman favored colorful expressions, often encouraging Norman's mother, Jeanette, a.k.a. Ding Dong, to stifle. Will you stifle? <laughs> Young Norman was an astute observer never forgetting the experiences or words that shaped him. One so the next music change starts at measure 22. The goal here was to continue the feel of the music, but start to move to a darker tone when the Father Coughlin clip comes in. The music so far has been in F major, and I want to end on some sort of minor chord for the next bit. My thought was that if I went to D minor, the bass note would be lower than on the F major, and that would not let me ratchet up the intensity a little bit. I go up a whole step to G minor and add a few timpani hits and gradually fade in some very tense high strings using one of the Evo string patches. So let's listen to that. Young Norman was an astute observer, never forgetting the experiences or words that shaped him. One day, while listening to his crystal radio, he heard Catholic priest Father Coughlin preach anti-Semitism. We believe in Christ's principle, and I challenge every Jew in this nation to tell me that he does not believe in it. Norman remembered that sermon for the rest of his life. Looking ahead, we're coming up to the attack on Pearl Harbor and his decision to join the armed forces in World War II and end up to starting his family life after World War II in Los Angeles. I felt it would be effective to have the music stop and become more ethereal. This section is where I got the material I added to the opening, and here it is with a different orchestration and more of the special effect strings and even a wind patch to give the music a haunting quality that I thought fit well with the images. My concept here was to create a mood, but not to dictate exactly what the viewer should be feeling, and leaving this kind of space in the music and choosing the right sonorities really helps in that effort. Again, this is a matter of proportion. This is not a World War II epic. It's a biopic about Norman Lear with World War II and his role in it. While this was an important part of his life, 
it was only one section. And looking at the whole arc of his life, you have to ask, how does it exactly fit into the full narrative? The chords here are suspended seventh chords in a drop two voicing that are descending. Let's take a look at those. Then I start the transition to the after war section by bringing in a short ascending motive in the winds that leads us to resolve this section on the downbeat. And I go back to a variation of the music from measure one of the opening, this time reorchestrated. And this leads us to his start in television and films. Let's take a look at that with the dialogue, that whole section. One day, while listening to his crystal radio, he heard Catholic priest Father Cogman preach anti-Semitism. We believe in Christ's principle, and I challenge every Jew in this nation to tell me that he does not believe in it. Norman remembered that sermon for the rest of his life. And when the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor, he left the safety of college to enlist in the Army Air Corps. I wanted to be known as a Jew who served, he'd later say. After the war, Norman moved his young family to... I have a measure of 13, 16 here. The tempo changes here to 68 beats per minute, 3, 4, 4, 4. Then I've got 52 beats per minute. That would sort of be like a fermata. And then a measure of 2, 4, and then after war. Let's watch this next bit. After the war... Norman moved his young family to Los Angeles and tried his hand at writing for television variety shows. It wasn't long after that he made his mark with films, earning an Oscar nomination for Divorce, American Style. You can hear how the After War section is a variation on the opening. It has the eighth note pulse with the dotted quarter note accent, da 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 and it has the suspended chord resolving. Let's just play the two of those back to back. Norman Milton Lear grew up in New Haven, Connecticut. After the war, Norman moved his young family to Los Angeles. And this is one way that you tell a story. You take material and you develop it over the timeline to fit in with the different sections. After the war, Norman moved his young family to Los Angeles and tried his hand at writing for television variety shows. It wasn't long after that he made his mark with films, earning an Oscar nomination for Divorce, American Style. Now I have to do some work here with time signatures. I've got a 3-4 and a 7-8 bar, and also a Pumoso right here. Tempo picks up from 98 to 107. And this is a a little transitional figure that I added. It doesn't have anything to do with any of the other music in the film. Earning an Oscar nomination for Divorce, American Style. But all the while, the country... This all leads us to the Vietnam section. Under the Vietnam section, the chords from the beginning are reprised and the orchestration is much more intense to reflect the civil unrest of the late 1960s. Let's listen to that, this time without the dialogue. You can hear those swarming patches. They really add a lot of life and animation to the track. And then I only have those for a couple of bars and these Evo strings come in. So it's a D suspended chord in third inversion. It's beautiful. This leads us to the social commentary shows that Norman produced in the 1970s. Notice here 
that the music is another variation of the opening, and I step up the dramatic level a notch. Norman put a spotlight on the issues of the day and made us confront our own humanity. He made television accountable and changed its role in our culture forever. Notice here that the piano's rhythm changes to 16th notes and the bass note change over the right hand figure on the piano. There's also an ascending cello figure and pulsing concertino string chords. At measure 55, which is right here, another variation of the chords from the very beginning that is even more intense as he is being persecuted personally by the President of the United States. Let's take a listen to that. To his great delight, Norman was placed on Nixon's enemies list. And yes, there's a tape. And I have the regular shows on every week. So what is it called? Arch, guys, communists, the right wingers, trying to destroy us. Yeah. And now let's listen to that with no dialogue. In this part, the string chords are augmented by motives passed around between the cellos, the horn, and the English horn. This leads us into the moral majority section, where the string chords here are leading us into the next section. The longer game here is that the Vietnam War and civil unrest of the late 1960s led Norman to produce TV shows that were a commentary on that time, which in turn led to him being ostracized by Nixon, which then led to the moral majority being formed, which spurred him to create people for the American way. So I wanted to write music that led me all the way through the unrest to the more positive people for the American way section. Let's take a listen to that all with dialogue. Just go back a little to after war. After the war, Norman moved his young family to Los Angeles and tried his hand at writing for television variety shows. It wasn't long after that he made his mark with films, earning an Oscar nomination for Divorce American Style. But all the while, the country was facing social turmoil and a revolution of ideas. Stunned by the banality of television, Norman put a spotlight on the issues of the day and made us confront our own humanity. He made television accountable and changed its role in our culture forever. To his great delight, Norman was placed on Nixon's enemies list. And yes, there's a tape. And I have the regular shows on every week. So what is it called? Archers, guys, communists, the right wingers. When the moral majority proclaimed the United States a Christian nation, Norman became a full-time activist. He founded People for the American Way. I hope that you can hear how the music keeps on evolving and moving forward through this entire section, which leads us to the People for the American Way right here. Now, I want to solo the click track here and turn it on and tell you that the way I figure out some of these tempos for all these different sections is I sing along a click track in my head as I'm watching the film and I try to figure out what that tempo is. Right, you see it hit that tape change to the tape machine. Hit that change to Nixon. And now I need to do a little ralentando. Just pick it up a little bit, which works with the music. And then, boom. So you notice that I'm not hitting every little picture change, just the ones that I think are important, or just enough to make it seem that the music is really timed with the film. You don't have to hit every little picture change. He founded People for the American Way and wrote television specials that celebrated our liberty. You can call me old boy, but 
let's just keep it simple. Uh, just call me Flag. In 2000, Norman. At this point, I bring in another variation of the opening music, and I try to add some instruments to give it even more of an uplifting feeling, an inspirational feeling, and a little bit of patriotism as well. That's why I've got the solo trumpet there. I think that's this track here. Playing with the horn. Right, let's listen to that without the dialogue. Right, there's also more activity in the basses there. Boom, 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 boom. There's more activity with the orchestra bells. And that lines up with the basses. Let's see, is that this? Right, see how it plays off of that? So these are all little things I do, all very simple little parts, but when you add them together and do a good job of orchestration and composing, they fit together like a hand in a glove. The filmmakers wanted the end to be big and bold and also to have people get off their seats and cheer after the screening of this at the Kennedy Center Honors Ceremony. Since I had not gone too high or too low in any of the previous music, I had quite a bit of leeway to work here. Again, this is a rearranged variation of that opening music. Also, I've not used any rhythmic percussion in the piece until this point, so the entry of the marching rhythm on the snares is very effective in driving the piece forward. Let's take a listen to this without any of the dialogue. Another thing to note is at the end here, the French horn melody is played by the 12 horn in unison patch, which is a very grand sound. And in the string section, you can hear a little bit of a flamenco rhythm. That really complements the march rhythm in the rest of the band. This all builds up to a rousing finish with a button at the end of the film. Let's take a listen to that again. Uh, let's start a little bit here at the People for the American Way with the dialogue all the way to the end. He founded People for the American Way and wrote television specials that celebrated our liberty. You can call me Old Glory, but let's just keep it simple. Uh, just call me Flag. In 2000, Norman bought an original copy of the Declaration of Independence and toured it around the country so kids could see the nation's birth certificate. Norman, you're a patriot, family man, friend, and one of the most influential producers of our time. And for that, I hope this video has been helpful. The setup part of this endeavor gets easier as you gain experience. Creating some templates and track presets in your sequencer can also make the setup process much less cumbersome. A few additional thoughts. Once we started to look at the music, I tried to show how 
a couple of simple ideas can be developed over the course of a film. How to vary your material and orchestrations to help the story unfold. Another point is that by shifting textures, rhythms, and the density of your music, you can create contrasts that unfold over time and keep the listener engaged. Soft and loud, energetic and atmospheric, light and shade. Understanding these contrasts and all the different levels between the extremes can really help the music tell a story. One area we did not discuss in detail was the use of automation in helping to animate the music. I went over it a little bit, but if we were to really examine the music, there is quite a bit of detailed work with articulation changes via key switches, as well as MIDI expression and mod wheel to change the dynamics and intensity of the sounds. If you like this video, please give a thumbs up. And if you'd want more content like this, please subscribe. Let's take this out by running the entire film with the final George Clooney narration. Thanks for watching. I have never been in a situation in my life, however tragic, where I didn't see some kind of just growing up the way I grew up. Norman Milton Lear grew up in New Haven, Connecticut. His father, Herman, gave him the nickname Meathead. Let me tell you something, Mr. Bunker. No, let me tell you something, Mr. Stivic. You are a meathead. <laughs> what did you call me? A meathead, dead from the neck up. Meathead. Herman favored colorful expressions, often encouraging Norman's mother, Jeanette, AKA Dingbat, to stifle. Will you stifle? <laughs> Young Norman was an astute observer, never forgetting the experiences or words that shaped him. One day, while listening to his crystal radio, he heard Catholic priest Father Coughlin preach anti-Semitism. We believe in Christ's principle, and I challenge every Jew in this nation to tell me that he does not believe in it. Norman remembered that sermon for the rest of his life. And when the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor, he left the safety of college to enlist in the Army Air Corps. I wanted to be known as a Jew who served, he'd later say. After the war, Norman moved his young family to Los Angeles and tried his hand at writing for television variety shows. It wasn't long after that he made his mark with films, earning an Oscar nomination for Divorce American style. But all the while, the country was facing social turmoil and a revolution of ideas. Bombs in Vietnam explode at home. Stunned by the banality of television, Norman put a spotlight on the issues of the day and made us confront our own humanity. He made television accountable and changed its role in our culture forever. To his great delight, Norman was placed on Nixon's enemies list. And yes, there's a tape. When the moral majority proclaimed the United States a Christian nation, Norman became a full-time activist. He founded People for the American Way, wrote television specials that celebrated our liberty. You can call me old boy, but let's just keep it simple. Uh, just call me Flag. In 2000, Norman bought an original copy of the Declaration of Independence and toured it around the country so kids could see the nation's birth certificate. Norman, you're a patriot, a family man, our friend, one of the most influential producers of our time. And for that, we the people are grateful.